So this will be our first video in a series looking at chapter 6 of the Barron's book of AP Physics dealing with linear momentum and center of mass. Specifically we're going to be covering uh, linear momentum and its definition, how it relates to Newton's law and what impulse is, the conservation of momentum and why that's important, uh, elastic and inelastic collisions which we already somewhat covered with uh, kinetic energy, the center of mass and how that center of mass moves. Okay, so we'll start off with the definition of linear momentum. Now momentum, which is usually shown by P, is basically the product of the mass and the velocity vector. And as you can see, because it's a mass times a velocity, we multiply the SI unit for mass times the derived unit for the velocity. So momentum is measured in kilogram meters per second in the SI uh, standard of units. Now momentum is much like force in that you can uh, have the superposition of the momentum. Basically, to get the total momentum within a system, all you have to do is sum the individual uh, parts. So you know you sum each individual mass times its velocity, and you will get the uh, total momentum of the system. So now, moving on from the definition of momentum and its sum total, we'll be looking at how force relates to momentum. And we'll start off by defining force as F equals MA, as we've done many times before. Now let's break up this A into its uh, constituent component. So A is really the derivative of velocity with respect to time. But if we separate this D dt out from that velocity, we get that force equals the derivative with respect to time of m times v. But we know from the definition of momentum that p is m times v. So force is really the derivative of momentum with respect to time. And that's actually how Isaac Newton, who came up with most of these laws, thought of uh, momentum and force. So this is another way of writing Newton's second law. Instead of F equals MA, you get F equals dP dt. So if you have, you know, the sum of the forces external is zero, that means that the change in momentum is also zero, which means that momentum is conserved. In other words, you don't change the total amount of momentum. Its magnitude and direction within the system don't change if there's no outside force acting on it. Moving on now, we're going to be uh, further relating momentum and force through the concept of impulse. Now impulse, which we'll get to the definition in a second, is represented usually by the letter J. An impulse is defined as the integral of force with respect to time. So if you had a graph of force versus time, and let's say it was that, then the uh, area below it, which is what the integral gives, this would give the total impulse of the system. And for constant forces, like this one right here, all you have to do is multiply the force that's happening times the delta time here, and you get the area of this rectangle. So J for constant forces is just force times delta time. But we know already an expression relating force and dt. So what is this? We know that force equals dp dt, basically the change in momentum with respect to time. So when you uh, separate the variables and bring this dt up, we know that f dt equals the change in momentum, the infinitesimally small change in momentum. Therefore, uh, impulse also equals the sum change in momentum. So let's say you have some initial momentum P1 and some final momentum P2. What the impulse gives is when you integrate this you just get P from P2 or from P1 to P2 or P2 minus P1 which is basically the change in momentum. So impulse really gives you the total change in momentum of the system, as well as the, uh, the easiest way to ref represent that geometrically is through this area under the graph of force with respect to time. And because it's just uh, a momentum minus another momentum, impulse is also in kilogram meters per second.
And just as we can with uh, forces or accelerations or uh, momentum, you can break up impulse into dimensional components. So for example, there's a change in momentum in the x direction. There's impulse is the change in momentum. The y impulse is the change in momentum in the y direction, etc. for however many dimensions you're looking at. Now, impulse is really useful for finding the average force acting on an object. So for example, if you have some force versus time plot and some curve like this where the force gradually increases and then increases again, at some point there is an average force where uh, it experiences the same change of momentum as though this constant force were acting on it. And impulse is really helpful for uh, determining that average force. So how does one do that? Well, you take the uh, formula for average value, which we know from calculus is the integral of f of x over uh, x2 minus x1, and that's from x1 to x2. And all we have to do is plug in this uh, force versus time plot. And we know that it's the integral from t1 to t2 of f of t dt over t2 minus t1. But this numerator right here is just the impulse. So this really becomes impulse over, well, t2 minus t1 is just the change in time. So the total impulse over the total change in time gives you the average force acting on an object. Now as the last concept we look at in this video before we do some practice next video, uh, we're going to be looking at elastic, inelastic, and totally inelastic collisions and their similarities and differences. So as I already mentioned, each of these are a type of collision. So one object banging into another uh, and a resulting velocity occurring. Now elastic collisions are the simplest. Basically these are where the kinetic energy is conserved. So you know, your initial kinetic energy equals your final kinetic energy. And these don't happen too often in nature because of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, these usually occur between subatomic particles. So for example, an electron and another electron coming close to one another and then repelling outwards. Moving on now, in inelastic collisions are what the vast majority of collisions in nature are. So these are as you may have guessed from in versus uh, regular elastic, is when kinetic energy is not conserved. So your initial kinetic energy does not equal your uh, final kinetic energy. And this is, you know, when some of the energy goes into basically what we call internal energy. So, you know, you have your heat, your sound, etc. All that is energy that is dissipated and can't be recovered. Now totally inelastic collisions are when uh, the energy is not conserved, just as with regular inelastic collisions, but the two objects, they stick together. So for example, if you had a car accident where the two front ends were mangled together and the cars came in like this and this and then resultant, they became one big metal mess and came out at that vector. That would be a totally inelastic collision. So for completely inelastic collisions, it actually makes the math very easy because uh, they share a common final velocity. So, you know, you have your initial m1 v1 plus m2 v2, their initial momentums, uh, and then all you have is basically they act as a combined mass with one singular final velocity. And for each one of these problems, you can solve uh, for the final velocity, the final momentum, what have you, dimensionally. In other words, uh, in terms of momentum in two or three space, depending on what you're working on. As you add dimensions, you basically just add another momentum problem. So you add, you know, the momentum in the x direction plus the y direction plus the z direction, etc. And it should also be noted that the conservation of momentum applies to all forces.
So even non-contact forces like gravity or electrostatics, what have you, momentum is always conserved regardless of what forces are acting. In the next video, we'll do some practice problems with the uh, concepts that we've covered. Uh, and from there, we will look at center of mass to conclude the chapter.